He acted accordingly, but he, he never laughed at it. He, he, he accepted it. He accepted it. I remember once a patient wanted to marry Jung. She was convinced that he was the man for her and for her lifetime. In vain, Jung explained to her that he already was married. She continued to be convinced and therefore Jung accepted. She went on, prepared a marriage deal, had printed cards, everything was ready. Jung continued to accept in full confidence of unconscious reactions coming from the patients or from him. And the day before the planned marriage, he got an express letter from the patient telling him that this night, God had told her that unhappiness the marriage would not be possible. The patient came out of her psychosis, had always in her memory this event, and was completely balanced afterwards. That's how you handles the transference situation as a full reality and having fully confidence in the unconscious which would lead the patient and himself through the seemingly difficult situation. He could see what every woman was really substantially like and helped her to find her main interest, literature, politics, psychotherapy, or astrology, or what she wants. He, he had an art to follow a person until she found herself. And the value of transference was great for Jung himself. It, it really was as if he was always in, inside of your unconscious and not trespassing but because he has been where everyone was, and so he knew how to be safe. He also would never use any of his terms, ever. My last interview, I told him a dream, and I realized, my God, that man is 85 years old, and it was a pages of dream, and so I only told him half the dream, thinking I can't put that all on him. And so then he started. You know, he didn't ask you for one association. Very seldom he did. He just started to talk. And I was kind of not making the connection which what he was talking about had anything to do with my dream, but I knew better that I would find the connection if I listen eventually. And uh, Suddenly he said, oh, that is as if you dream. And he told me the second part of my dream, which I hadn't told him. Um, after about two years, I had a dream in which Jung had died. And uh, I was in his house in the entry chamber where he was uh, laid up. And I paced up the room, very depressed, very unhappy. And suddenly my feeling changed, as if I put up, I pulled up my socks and, oh, all right, he's dead now, this was to go on and work. I told Jung that dream, and he said, well, all right, now you can see patients. You're ah. ready to see patients. One didn't see it, but one felt it, that a ray of his spirit was falling onto us. And uh, one was terribly spoiled, because uh, compared with this, as a man, we are no more so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that must have been a problem. And I must say, besides one's own husband. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were married. And I was married. Yeah. You had a deep relationship. And yes. how did your husband feel? Did he ever feel jealous of you? Clear. All our husbands, of our, the husbands of our gr uh, of the, uh, women around, were very jealous. Yes. But uh, since then, you yeah, understand that Jung was not falling into the traps and wishes of the women, <laughs> so they had not to be really jealous, right. because Jung never misused his position 
and all these transferences. Now, Jung worked in this rejected feminine world of the unconscious for years. People came to him, he was particularly successful with women pa patients. And one person came into his life very early on because she's already with Jung and Emma Jung at the famous conference in Vienna where they are all photographed together. And that is Tony Wolf. Well, all I can say is that, of course, uh, she was a most extraordinary person. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> and uh, and uh, she was a great head to Jung, too. I mean, when it comes to psychological types, for instance, she played a very important part right. there. Not very in, the, in his development of uh, his he ideas. He had all his knowledge in philosophy and so on and so forth. Uh -huh. And... and uh, she was, she, she had been one of his uh, patients to begin I with. I see. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, I remember very well, he was very proud of the fact that he had succeeded in curing her. A lot of people who knew her said that they despaired of her ever recovering from whatever a psychological disturbance was. I think one must accept that it was profound enough to fit uh, the rare, exceptional spirit that she was, because in a sense, the rarer, the more exceptional the spirit, the deeper the psychological suffering. And Jung managed to bring her out of this, so that by the time of the famous Vienna conference, she was already an integrated working personality. And to me, that photograph is very moving, because the one who looks young, as if she's just been born, is Tony Wolf. She sits there with, this, with these large eyes. Uh, Jung had an instinct at what was wrong with life, what made life tear apart, made it incomplete, was because the feminine was rejected, driven insane, driven mad by a world of men, rejected by a masculine dominated world. And that time when he let himself go and when he landed deep down in what he came to call the collective unconscious, all this rejected feminine in himself confronted him. Tony Wolf was being analyzed by Jung when Jung started to have his active imagination. It really got going and he got rather unstable. And that Tony Wolf simply said that she wasn't going to go on with her analysis with him and that she was going to have a relationship with him and um, and more or less I gather took him by the ear and, and did so. In this unfamiliar, terrifying underground of the collective unconscious, she was Jung's guide to such an extent that she lived with him and she took over the whole of the burden. And, of course, the tensions caused by that in Zurich and in the family must have been tremendous. She reflected his anima in a way that Mrs. Jung didn't. It was she who introduced him to all the Eastern uh, things, Eastern spirituality, Eastern philosophy, and so on. They were lovers, I take it. Oh, yes. Yes. Emma knew of their relationship, but she didn't wish to divorce you. Oh, good gracious, no. It would never have entered her head. No, I, um, I mean, that wouldn't have been done. I mean, That's rather was... unusual. No, I don't think so. Not at that time. I mean, I don't even think nowadays. I mean, she had four children, and I don't think that you would have uh, wanted a divorce at all. Well, uh, perhaps this isn't really relevant, but not many women will countenance open infidelity. Uh, please forgive me. Uh, I, am, uh, <laughs> I am not so sure if that is not a kind of uh, British, maybe even English prejudice conditioning or something. I think that... I think it's an American one, too. Is it? 
without Tony Wolf, he couldn't have made it because she had b breaks in a way and she was stopping him always when he had a temperament where he was losing himself completely mm. and uh, without boundaries. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tony Wolf stopped him and always brought him back to reality. And that was tremendously important for you. Was she originally a patient? And then she also understood him. Yes. She had such a bright mind that she grasped it even before he understood it. And uh, she was also uh, really furthering his intuition very much. Because at that time he came, he was also, I mean, he, he was a medical doctor. He had worked at the asylum of Burkholzli. Yes. And he was very intellectual until really he came to know her. That was the point. There was nothing shadow in it, no shadow. And Jung wanted to be and tr tried to be as conventional as possible, wherever possible. So that in the inner world where, and in his relationships with both women, he could be as unconventional as, as he really was, as unique as he really was. It was quite a thing for him to do in 19, between nine, around 1910, you know, the Victorian age wasn't quite so far gone, and it wasn't anything he hid, you know. I remember I was walking in, uh, uh, in Zurich there near the institute, and there was young and Tony Wolf walking. You know? <laughs> there was nothing hiding. And it was in this relationship that he had these... Uh, Tremendous experiences of the conjunctio. That's when he understood the mystical uh, background of sexuality. Mystical or the psychological archetype that was working there. That was later such an established relationship and Mrs. Jung was so included that uh, I am very sure he would not have parked his car in front of Tony's Wolf's house, who was one minute away from the Institute, and everybody would know when he was there and when he was not there, if he would have had his slightest doubts about it. And so this relationship with Tony Wolf was not an affair, it was another wife. Two wives and one man. Oh, that, uh, that's an excuse. My opinion is... Uh, he should, as C.G., he should know earlier that that was his anima. And so, come to a stop. One day, Mrs. Jung approached me and said, would you please cooperate analytically with me and Tony Wolf? <laughs> <laughs> so we did a threesome analysis for quite a long period yeah, of time. Of <laughs> oh. yeah. That was very funny. I see. Mutual of mutual dreams or just Jung's dreams? No, 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 no Jung's dreams. Uh, Mrs. Jung's dreams and, and Tony's dreams and my dreams. Oh, all three. Yeah. I see. I see. <laughs> <laughs> and you found this very helpful? It was interesting. Right. It was very, yeah, very interesting. interesting. She wasn't at all browbeaten by Jung. She was downright and direct. And she did a lot of work on his papers, too. She obviously um, stood by Jung all through these periods of crisis. She was a much more solid sort of character than Jung. First she had given birth to five children. And then she had, Jung told us, and she told us, and she felt the need also to know more. And then she, she studied physics and mathematics and many other things. And then she had an analysis with her own husband. Yes. Yes. How difficult. <laughs> yes. She had also another analysis, huh. but um, the main thing was analysis with Jung. And afterwards, he allowed her to analyze. And she was a very good analyst. And uh, the opposite of her husband, he was more intuition and thinking. And Emma Jung was sensation, mainly sensation. 
absolutely down to the earth and more to that, to the <laughs> steps of the earth. Mrs. Jung had a fantastic sense of humor. She giggled and laughed and she was a very, very nice woman. Mm. Motherly, mm -hmm. but I think she helped a lot in working out, uh, let's say, the animus anima problem. It's those three who did uh, the work, I think. Emma Jung said to a close friend of mine just before she died that she had never ceased to be grateful in her life for Tony Wolf because Tony Wolf was able to do for her husband something that she could not have done. I think it's what's remarkable is that uh, they made it. And I think they're the ones that Tony and Emma are the ones that made the threesome situation possible. They worked it out something, worked out something between them. Jung, in his uh, dedication copy of Answer to Job, wrote, uh, well, I have to translate it, uh, unasked, dropped from heaven. They, uh, ungefragt vom Himmel befallen. So, uh, no, no, I think uh, naturally uh, the relationship changed, the relationship do change, but it existed. And he was always very present and very concerned also about the future uh, of life on this globe. I think he needed space and, and quietness to meditate about them and to find as much answer as he could find. It was a, at the same time, a, I think, a total participation, but also uh, uh, well, I wouldn't call it a withdrawal, but a philosophical distance, or I don't know how to call it. He went to Berlin in so many, in so often the year, during the year, and, uh, and he did all his reading up there. Most of the reading was done there, and also most of the writing. Also, right. In the fall uh, of 1922. He came by bicycle, Dr. Jung came by bicycle yeah. on, on his bicycle from Christoph. The western part of the land uh, was sold by Mr. Rupert uh, father 
to Dr. Yu. So, about his father and Dr. Yu had a very good relation. That's a boy, Doctor. Gerade am Ja, 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 ja. Und der Brüder drei noch. Was macht der Uli? Sie bereiten uns im letzten Moment mit Schluss. Ja, mit Geld gerechnet. Es geht mit Ebrimot. Nein, ich bin auch nicht jetzt behaupten. And when they were in, in trouble, you see, for instance, we bring it in the hay before it came raining, uh, Dr. Jung would help them. A man is not complete when he lives in a world of the statistical truth. He must live in a world of his biological truth. Man has always lived in the myth. And uh, we think we are able to be born today and to live in no myth, in, without history. Because uh, that that's is a, a disease that's absolutely abnormal because man is not born every day. He is once born in, in a specific historical setting with the specific historical qualities and therefore he is only complete when he has a relation to, to these things. It's just as if you were born without eyes and ears uh, when, you are born, when you are growing up with no connection with the past. From the, natural, from the standpoint of natural science, you need no connection with the past. You yes. can wipe it out. Yes. And that is, that is a, a, a mutilation of, of, of the human being. He had what the Greeks called the techne, uh, hence our word uh, technology and so on. And uh, techne means uh, also art and skill. He, he lived his, he, his sensation, I think, in, his, in its natural state. And, and therefore it was very creative. He looked at the wall in his last years. You see the, the irregularities of the stone would uh, create that picture and then he would carve it out. The statements of every uh, religion and of many uh, uh, poets and so on are uh, uh, statements about the inner uh, um, mythological process, which is a necessity because man is not complete. If he is not conscious of uh, that aspect of things. Well, we have to revive primitive superstition because in primitive people, they, their sword has a soul, their hammer has a soul. No smith would start making a sword without a ritual first. The, still in the Middle Ages, the heroes who depended on their sword, think if your sword breaks in battle, you are, you are a dead man. So their sword had a name and a soul. They knew that sword and the solidity of that sword was, was their fate. And now it's still so. Let a few of your... Uh, atomic plants explode and please matter matter if it has to cooperate with you needs loving care and not no, only technically by oiling and so on you have to kind of live with it <laughs> otherwise it plays you tricks one of the last times he went to the tower for instance he hadn't been there for a long time and the first days uh, the covers of the pans like to jump off and fall on the floor in the wrong moments and you know how objects uh, can absolutely misbehave. 
So he, st he put himself up in the middle of the kitchen and said, now, ladies and gentlemen, pots and, <laughs> and spoons, uh, I know I have neglected you for a long time and you are angry with me, but I beg your pardon and I ask you now to cooperate again. And from then on, there were no more accidents. <laughs> he had great fun with that. <laughs> If you notice, it's highly symbolic, the days you can't open a door, you can't get at something, or some object hides from you, just when you, you generally when you are in, not in yourself and in, in an impatient mood or so on, then everything plays you tricks. It's naturally your own unconscious mixed up with it. But it, it, it communicates with matter. We are only deeply unconscious of these facts because we live all by our, our senses and outside of ourselves. If, if a man could look into himself, he would discover it. Yes. And when a man discovers it, in our days, he thinks he's crazy. <laughs> and yeah. he may be crazy. He played a lot uh, along the lake. And he did it uh, very often alone. He took always a little shovel, removed the sand, and then played with little rivers and so on. And he said when he was 83, he said one day when we were playing, I, uh, I was generally watching him, playing a bit with him. And uh, he said to me, you know, only today I have suddenly thought, what am I doing when I'm playing like that? That's what I have done all my life, uh, digging out springs. He was just enjoying that. He called it the water works. And always before he was writing, he did some days or even weeks of water works till he was in the right mood. And then he began writing. I sat sometimes for hours beside him, just watching, not talking. Once an old peasant went along and said to me, Is this, isn't this Professor Jung not a world famous man? And I said, yes. He is, and he said, wouldn't think it if you see him like that. <laughs> I, I have the feeling I am able to help this thing which guides my life. I am not doing it, but I can help him in some way. And that's something which, which probably Jung has uh, invoked in me. Your good ideas are not produced by your will. It come to you. You must you must make yourself ready. I think that's all. And you must have a certain amount of interest. And that's also when you when you have a difficulty in yourself, you must you must be interested. You must get the answers from somewhere. You can't produce it yourself. You can't calculate it. And uh, it, it it must. At least most of the important things come from, from somewhere, and the rest you can then afterwards work out by a, a kind of uh, technique or routine and so on. But you can't do everything with routine. I was always looking for for something in between, you know, something that linked that remote past with, with the present moment. Uh, and I found, to my amazement, it is alchemy. It is the, 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 the basis of our modern way of conceiving things. Uh, and, and therefore, it is as if it were right under the threshold of consciousness. Uh, uh, this is a, a wonderful picture of how uh, the development of archetypes, that means the movement of, of archetypes, uh, looks uh, when you look upon them as if from above, maybe from today, you look back into the past and you see how the present moment has evolved out, out of the past. And we can construct or even predict our, uh, the, the, the unconscious of our days, when we know what, what it has been yesterday. 
And when, when I heard Jung talking about alchemy, it was like a revelation for me. To see how... Uh, because they are... Uh, religious ideas which are on the on the foundation of all these uh, uh, all these uh, scientific work the energy that you do that that you start to do chemistry comes from somewhere which is not a, a, a really rational thing it's an emotional thing for for young religion was an attitude for Jung, religion was an attitude to life and had absolutely nothing whatever to do with any kind of creed. And uh, he um, was uh, actually ambivalent about creeds because on the one hand he said that a, a creed would stop you from having an experience and since he believed that religion was not only an attitude but had to do with experience, personal experience, if you block it by a creed, obviously you can't have an experience. Uh, but at the same time, he also thought that a creed might be a tremendously important framework uh, for someone whose ego was too weak to stand the horror, the void of complete loneliness. But he was always saying, why don't the priests go down with me into the collective, into the unconscious of modern man, to learn what the modern soul is about before they start to cure it? Because nobody, nobody would look at the soul of man in the modern way. They all behaved, as I said before, as if creation was accomplished, if the soul was an accomplished fact. And it wasn't. That's why the Book of Revelations had so much meaning to Jung. And that's why he saw it having its place in the Bible. You know, Calvin fought very desperately to have the Book of Revelation removed from the Bible because he called it a dark and dangerously obscure book. But it really is very meaningful because it's the one book which suggests that the revelation of God doesn't end with the coming of Christ. There is more to come. Uh, that religion is a process of continuing revelation and experiencing of revelation and being obedient to your greater awareness of becoming in life. He was very conscious of the center of his being which he called the self. And he would talk about the God image living, being alive in this center of our whole being. He always said he did not wish to discuss the existence of God because this was a metaphysical question which he was not prepared to go into. But from the psychological point of view, he knew that the God image was within oneself. The God image changes. God does not change. Any kind of human work could reveal something about the nature of God or about his existence. I only know that the idea of God is uh, a pattern, an age-old pattern, a primitive pattern that always has been and never lost its, what we call, luminosity. Uh, it is always there and it still plays the same role as it always did. 
we can establish the existence of that pattern. And that is, for our practical purposes, enough. Because when we can integrate such an idea in our mind, uh, the, the idea of such a being, then that gives an entirely different scope to things. does uh, not project, you see, just because, does not confuse the image of God that exists in man with God himself, which says he cannot make any statements about God, but about the image of God as it exists in the human being, you know? And so this whole ego-self relationship is really at the, so to speak, at the basis of Jung's work. That's all it is about, you know? the self experience as something inside man, but not the same as the ego. You know? but, but he doesn't project it. Jung puts the burden squarely on each person. And this psychology of individuation, of making what you are, and what you have inherited of the universe, of making that specific, of making what you've got of the collective in you, making that individual, and carrying it as an individual, and not only standing still in it, but allowing an act of becoming in the midst of your being, to become your own way of moving through life. This is the hardest thing you can ask of human beings. What would you say the main value of the research and the writing that you and Jung have done on alchemy is? I would say that a civilization needs a myth to live. We know that if missionaries destroy the myth of a primitive people, they, they destroy them also physically. They begin to drink, they degenerate, they are lost. And no civilization can live only from welfare. It needs, it needs a myth to live. All civil, great civilizations, when they were flourishing, had a living myth. And I think that the Christian myth on which we have lived has degenerated and has become one-sided and insufficient. And I think that alchemy is the complete myth. And that therefore, if our civili Western civilization has a, a possibility of survival, it would be by accepting the alchemical myth, which is a completion and continuation, but and richer completion of the Christian myth. That's a myth we could live, ag live again with, in contrast to the Christian myth, which doesn't satisfy a great amount of people anymore. And the Christian myth is deficient on not including enough the feminine, or in Catholicism they have the Virgin Mary, but it's only the purified feminine. It's not the dark feminine. And in excluding matter and treating matter as dead and the realm of the, of the devil. And in not facing the problem of the opposites of evil. And alchemy faces the problem of the opposites, faces the problem of matter, and faces the problem of the feminine. The three things which are lacking in Christianity. And therefore it complements Christi the Christian myth, and could revive it too, that way. 
for 2,000 years, the Christian religion has told you to repress the evil. And look at the damn thing now. It began to be so visible at the First World War. And that's now a very great many years ago, isn't it? Sure. And it's on a much grand, grander scale, much larger scale, the possibility. Oh, far. Far. What is it? What did we learn from alchemy? It's finally that in each of us there is a rejected part, the corners which be can become the cornerstone, like it's written in the Bible. And uh, we we have to be aware of the stinking side, of the bad smelling side, of the, as Jung says, about the urine, about the excrement, and all that in our lives. And this is the beginning of the way of God. This is the beginning of the transformation. The psychology of individuation has nothing to do with politics at all, because it deals with the ultimate values. But yes, it has shattering political implications. And I think we are not now. We cannot behave as if this journey into the collective unconscious hasn't happened. Because it has happened, we can't plead ignorance anymore. It has happened, and because it's happened, because we are fa facing a universe within, objective universe within, as great as the universe without, we can never be the same again. We cannot ignore it. And it has enormous political consequences for us. And the kind of society, the, the kind of politics that will save us, will have to be where more important than any other quality in our political politicians, we will must demand psychological illumination, psychological awareness, because otherwise we get people sparring with their own shadows. Otherwise you get nations, as we had in 1939, like the Germans, projecting their shadows onto the Jews. And then when they were eliminating the Jews onto the Poles and God knows what not else, you see. And Jung often said to me, he said, the human being who starts by withdrawing his own shadow from his neighbor, is doing work of immense, immediate political and social importance. What, what you would call the personal shadow of people didn't upset him. He just grumbled and cursed a bit. But that's not the problem of evil. It's that major evil of complete destruction which worried him. And his real approach to that was the inner work Yes, that he did. the only thing you can do, to confront yourself with it, where you are. All the rest, all the benevolent, if benevolent preaching would help, then we would be out of the trouble long ago, because we, have, we get a lot of benevolent and reasonable preaching, but it doesn't help. So the only place where you can really put the hand on it and deal with it body to, to body, the problem of evil is in yourself. And there you have to, the hope to change something, but the hope to change the world is a, is a childish illusion. As we've seen the collectivist pattern taking over all over society, the, the paradox is you get a form of totalitarianism, which is producing collectivism, then you get a, a, a kind of creation of greater and greater monopolies of commerce, bigger and bigger business, produ producing a kind of organization man, which is the equivalent of the totalitarian organization man, where, the, where this individual thing disappears. And really, this kind of individual, uh, this kind of politics of individuation, which you might call, democracy ceases to exist. And this is the point where we have reached, we've reached at the moment. And at this point, all that's inferior, which Jung used to call the shadow in man, tends to come to the surface. The world hangs on a thin thread. Yeah. And that is the psyche of man. Nowadays, we are not threatened by elementary catastrophes. There is no such thing as an H-bomb. 
That is all man's doing. Yeah. We are the great danger. The psyche is the great danger. What if something goes wrong with the psyche? Yeah. Yeah. See? Yeah. And <coughs> so you see, it is, it is demonstrated to us in our days what, what the power of the psyche is of man. How important it is to know something about it. But we know nothing about it. No, nobody would, uh, would give credit to the idea that uh, the psychical uh, 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 processes of the ordinary man have any importance whatever. One thinks, oh, he has just uh, what he has in his head. It is all from his surroundings. He's taught such and such a thing, believes such and such a thing. And particularly if he's well housed and well fed, then he has no idea at all. And that, that's the great mistake. Because he is just that as which he is born, and he is not born as tabula rasa, but, but as, as a reality. Yes. 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 Jung had a vision at the end of his life of a catastrophe. It was a world catastrophe. I don't want to speak much about it. One of his daughters took notes, and after his death gave it. And there is a drawing with a line going down, up and down, and under his Neath is the last 50 years of humanity. And, and some remarks about the final catastrophe being ahead. But I have only those notes. Mm -hmm. What is your own feeling about it, the, the world Well, situation? one's whole, one's whole feeling revolts against this idea. But since I have those notes in a drawer, I, I don't allow myself to be too optimistic. I think, well, we have always had wars and enormous catastrophes, and I, I, I have no more personal fear much about that. I mean, at my age, if you, ha you have any house soon to go, so or so or so, it egocentrically spoken. But, but the beauty of all the life, uh, to think that the billions and billions and billions of years of ev evolution to build up the plants and the animals and the whole beauty of nature, and that man would go out of sheer shadow foolishness and, foolishness and destroy it all. I mean, that all life might go from the planet. And we don't know. On Mars and Venus, there's no life. We don't know if there's any life experiment elsewhere in the galaxies. And we go and destroy this. I think it's so abominable. I, I, I try to pray that it may not happen, that a miracle happens. Do you find that uh, young people that you see now are aware of that, that, that in, it's in their consciousness? Yes, it's it partly in their unconscious and partly in their consciousness, and I think in a very dangerous way, namely in a way of giving up and running away into a fantasy world. You know, you, when you study science fiction, you see there's always the fantasy of escaping to some other planet and begin anew again, which means give up the battle on this earth. Look, uh, consider it hopeless and give up. I think one shouldn't give up. Because if you think of answer to Job, if man would wrestle with God, if man would tell God that he shouldn't do it, if we would reflect more, That's why reflection comes in. Jung never thought that we might do better than just possibly sneak around the corner with not too big a catastrophe. When I saw him last, he, he had also a vision while I was with him. But there he said, I see enormous stretches devastated, enormous stretches of the earth. But thank God it's not the whole plan. I think that if not 
more people try to reflect and take back their projections and take the opposites within themselves, there will be a total destruction. There are a lot of people who go through life and the unconscious is no reality to them. They say at breakfast I had a funny dream and that in the afternoon they don't know anything about it anymore. But if they paint them and interpret them and think about them, the dream becomes real. And that's why you have to be lonely so that the unconscious becomes stronger. You, it's like loading up the unconscious and then it manifests. Hermes Trismegistus said in, in one active imagination to an alchemist, I am the friend of whoever is lonely. We have now, you see, it's a man who pours water into the fish. Now the fish is the unconscious, the content. So we have to support the unconscious. It's not enough to, to just have it. We have to actively turn towards it and support it so that it then helps us. Many people are not in analysis, but if they are naturally gifted, which I would call if they are honest, they can find these things without analysis. I've lived in this tower sometimes three weeks alone without speaking to one word to anybody. And I sometimes thought I was going off my head. But the unconscious became alive. It was my partner. There are no other similar beings like man uh, that are articulate and yes. could uh, uh, give account of yes. their functioning. 